Hello! Welcome back. Uh, if you are in my class, congratulations on getting it through midterm one. Uh, and if you are not in my class, may I suggest buying the same textbook that my class is using that helped them get through midterm one. Uh, a step-by-step -step guide to the principles of microeconomics, which will help you answer the questions that you will see in your own principles of micro class. So what we are going to do today is we are going to be talking a little bit more about the markets and how economists deal with markets and, and getting at a little bit more of what's going on under the hood and, and why that's going to be useful, uh, we're going to talk about in a minute. So a little bit of a recap of what we've gone through in all the lectures so far. So what have we covered? So we talked about production possibility frontiers. We talked about specializing and trading and the idea of how you can improve production by just allocating tasks a little bit more efficiently. And this told us about you know, the aspects of production and, and how different people can come together to produce useful things and trade with each other. Uh, we also talked about the supply and demand model of the competitive market uh, and how you can take those goods that are produced in the processes that the production possibility frontier describes, take them, sell them in the market. And we can talk about how that market's going to come together as being a bunch of consumers and producers and how we're going to get an equilibrium price and quantity that we can predict using those two lines and where they come together. We also talked about how the predictions of the supply and demand model change when we start moving the bits of the supply and demand model around. How do we see what's going to happen and how do we predict what's going to happen with equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity when we see supply and demand shift to the left or to the right. Uh, so what we're going to be doing in the next section of the course, and really for the next uh, number of lectures, is we're going to be taking these component pieces of this model and we're really going to be breaking them down. Uh, we're going to be seeing really what's going to be happening at the individual level. right? Because as I've mentioned before, that production possibility frontier, each little dot on that line, as you zoom in infinitely close to that nice smooth curve that represents an entire country, is a single person. And each tiny little spot on a supply or demand curve is a person or a firm that is making an individual behavioral decision of whether or not to buy that good, what to spend their time on, whether or not to make that good and provide it to the market. And we're going to be able to explain not just what's going on with the overall picture, but what is happening at the individual level. What is the behavioral activity that is going to explain what those people are doing and why they're doing it? Now, why are we going to be bothering with this? Well, this is going to help us get to a model of behavior. And once we can start explaining behavior, using incentives in the way that we've been talking about before, it's going to help us understand market activity in a lot of different scenarios. Right? Remember, this supply and demand model that we've covered so far is specifically a description of competitive markets. And as I've mentioned before, the modern economy has fewer and fewer competitive markets all the time. So there's a lot of markets that this just doesn't really explain that well. But once we break down the parts of the market and understand what is happening at the individual level, the individual consumer and the individual producer, we can then take that behavioral model and build it back up in ways that's going to be more flexible and help us understand other forms of markets as well and other forms of behavior, even behavior that doesn't take place in a market. Uh, and we're also going to be able to understand how exactly cha these changes that we've talked about get into the market and move things around and how they're going to relate to that individual economic surplus. Remember we talked about that long ago, it's coming back, this idea of economic surplus. And we're going to be able to, once we have this behavioral model in place, talk about not just what's going to happen around, happen to the price and quantity in a market, but also who gets what out of a market. Who's happy that the market exists? Who is really getting a, gaining a lot as the a result of the existence of this market? And how much are they gaining? And how does things changing in the market change the gain that they have? So that's the grand plan. We're going to explain everything. We're going to explain all these markets. We're going to explain everything from these big changes all the way to the individual behavior that underlies the individual consumption decisions of millions of people around the world. And thankfully, there is a single rule that explains all of it. And here it is, it's the golden rule of economics, and it is marginal benefit equals marginal cost. That's it. That's the whole thing. Basically, all of economics comes from this one simple rule, from the stuff that you are learning right now to the stuff that is being written about in doctoral dissertations around the world. It all comes back to this. So. 
that's it. That, that's, I mean, I mean I, you're probably expecting me to say, you know, it's not really this simple, but it is. It's really this simple. Once you figure out what marginal benefit is and once you figure out what marginal cost is, well, you just got to set them equal to each other. And understanding what happens when you set them equal to each other is going to explain behavior. It's going to explain the behavior in these markets, whatever kind of market they are, whether they're competitive or not, and whether it's a market or not, or some other form of behavior. So this sounds like a pretty important rule. It is. And by the way, in the future in this class, if I ask you what is explaining what's going on, it's not always going to be the answer, but saying marginal benefit equals marginal cost is going to be the right answer most of the time. So remind, let's get a quick reminder of what these things are. So remember this word marginal, we've brought up before in terms of marginal value, marginal cost. Marginal basically means one more. Okay. Uh, marginal benefit is just a more generic way of saying uh, marginal value. Right? Marginal value is specific to consumers, but marginal benefit can be any sort of benefit. You can imagine the marginal benefit uh, to a producer as well. Uh, in addition to a consumer. So it's the same idea as marginal value, right? What is the additional benefit or the additional value that you get from doing one more unit of this thing, buying one more unit of this thing, producing one more unit of this thing, uh, whatever it is. And we're going to set that equal to marginal cost, which is basically the same idea as we had before. It's what is the additional cost of buying one more unit of this thing, selling one more unit of this thing, doing one more unit of this thing. Uh, once you know what those marginal benefits are, and once you know what those marginal costs are, you can predict how people are going to make decisions. We're going to have a behavioral model that predicts how those individual decisions are made in a way that lets us predict how lots of individual decisions are made and how they aggregate together to make those whole big markets that have millions of individual decisions inside of them all the time. Uh, so, quick reminder, these marginal benefits and costs, these are distinct, by the way, from total benefits and costs. Uh, the total amount of benefit that you get from something is important, it's good to know, but it's not the same thing as what the marginal benefit is that you're going to actually make your decision on the basis of. Right? We're saying that your decision is made on the basis of your marginal benefits and marginal costs. Uh, we talked about the cost-benefit principle, we talked about the incentive principle. Well, the cost-benefit principle is saying Choose the option for which the benefits most exceed the costs, which translates to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. The incentive principle says that people follow incentives, which translates to people set marginal benefits equal to marginal costs. We have the note cash on the table principle, the equilibrium principle, that tells us where market stops. That basically just says that the market stops when everyone set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. It shows up everywhere. It's really the key of all the things that we've talked about up to now. And we want to make those decisions on the basis of the cost-benefit principle, maximize our economic surplus, right? Uh, which means that we're making the, the, the decisions on the basis of marginal benefits and costs, not total benefits and costs. Let's think about what that distinction is. So let's imagine, for example, that you have a well-stocked pantry at home. You got a lot of food in your house, okay? Uh, now, the value of all that food in your house might be rather high. You, you like having it around. The value to you of having such a well-stocked pantry is, let's say, $300. Now, uh, the, uh, however, that's the total benefit of having all that food in your pantry. Now that you have such a well-stocked pantry, you don't really need any more food. So even though the total value of the food in your house is $300, the marginal value of adding one more, remember marginal means one more, the marginal value of adding one more uh, can of chili to your pantry is something like $0. Right. Even though the food as a whole very valuable, the value of one additional bit of food not very high. So that's the distinction between total and marginal benefit. And once you have that distinction in your head, once you have the idea of how you can understand what these marginal benefits and marginal costs are, that really is it. You think about what's the marginal benefit, what's the marginal cost, and you're pretty much done. So I've been drilling into you that this is the rule, this is the golden rule, this is how we're going to make all of our decisions. Uh, but let me at least prove to you that it should be, in fact, the rule, that this is the right rule to follow. So I'm going to talk about where the marginal benefit equals marginal cost rule comes from. And it comes from following the cost benefit principle, uh, or following the no cash on the table principle. Either way, like I said, everything pretty much translates back to marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Uh, so. The cost-benefit principle says that we should take an action if the benefits most exceed the costs. And of course, we're including the indirect costs and benefits in there as well. 
So let's take this basic principle, the cost-benefit principle, and apply it to the question of whether or not to buy something. Okay, and we're going to go back to our standard little example of the jalapeno. It makes its appearance once again. So, as we've talked about before, I value that jalapeno in the grocery store at $3, and it costs me $0.20 cents to buy. And let's imagine for a second that I've already incorporated all the indirect costs and benefits, all those opportunity costs. So that $30 and that $0.20, cents, that is the total. Uh, that's the direct and indirect costs and benefits that we're facing. Okay, so question is, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Should I buy this jalapeno? And the answer is yes. Yes, I should, right? The three dollars is more than 20 cents, so the benefits outweigh the costs. So yes, I'm going to go ahead and buy that jalapeno. Now, let's take this one step further and ask, am I going to buy a second jalapeno? Now, I already have a jalapeno, right? Uh, and that's going to be good. I'm going to put it in the chili that I'm going to make or whatever I'm going to do with it. Uh, but do I want a second jalapeno now that I already have the first one? Now, I might want a second jalapeno. I'd get something out of that, but I don't value it quite as much as I value the first one. Let's say I value that second jalapeno. My marginal value or my marginal benefit for the second jalapeno is only $2.50, not $3. Okay. Am I going to buy that one? Well, yeah. $2.50 is still higher than $0.20. Cents. Uh, so before we get to any further in this, let's just take a quick break and think about, okay, first of all, what is the marginal benefit here? Well, it's the benefit that I get out of having one more jalapeno in my life, okay? Uh, it's the benefit, it's the benefit that I derive from having that additional jalapeno. And again, it has nothing to do with the price of the jalapeno, right? If the price of the jalapeno was instead of 20 cents, a dollar, I wouldn't suddenly value the jalapeno more. That doesn't make any sense. Or I wouldn't value it less either. Because when I'm talking about the marginal benefit of a jalapeno, I'm talking about how much benefit do I derive out of just being handed a jalapeno. I would value getting this jalapeno as much as I would value being handed $3 or $2.50 if I already have a jalapeno. So that's the marginal benefit. What's the marginal cost? Well, it's just the price that I'm spending on those jalapenos plus whatever opportunity costs happen to me in the picture. So let's expand this. Uh, so let's draw out a table. So we got the number of jalapenos, I'm going to call that N. We have the marginal cost of buying each jalapeno, and we have the marginal benefit of buying each jalapeno. Let's talk about the first six jalapenos that I could buy. Now in each case, I'm just buying a jalapeno from a store, so the marginal cost is going to be the same. So the first one costs 20 cents, so does the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one, and the sixth one. Okay, marginal costs in this case are staying the same all throughout. But my marginal benefit is declining. Okay, uh, that value of that first, first jalapeno at $3. I value the second one only at $2.50. Now, once I have two jalapenos, I'm not getting that much out of the third one. I would value that third one really only at $1. Now, that fourth one's probably either going to end up rotting or it's going to make that chili too spicy. Uh, so I'm only going to value that fourth one at $0.50. Cents. Uh, the fifth one, even less, that's only $0.20. Cents. And then the, the sixth one is only going to be $0.10. Cents. Okay, so I've got a table here. It tells me for each jalapeno, what is my marginal benefit of buying that jalapeno, and what is my marginal cost. So a couple things to note here about marginal benefit. First of all, note that marginal benefit is going down as the quantity goes up. This again is going to help us get a distinction between marginal benefit and total benefit. Now, my life doesn't get worse when you give me extra jalapenos, right? It gets better. Uh, but the amount by which it gets better every time you give me another jalapeno gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? The total benefit that I get from jalapenos is, goes up and up and up because the marginal benefit is only talking about the additional benefit that I get, not how happy I am in total, okay? Second, notice that marginal benefit is going down. This is sort of a general rule when we're talking about consumers. Uh, that the marginal benefit or the marginal value declines the more of something you have. Think about pizza, for example. Right? You really like a first slice of pizza. Pizza's great. You also really enjoy your second slice of pizza. Maybe not as much as the first one, uh, because you were really hungry for the first one, and for the second one, you're just sort of filling out the meal. The third one, if you eat it, you're going to enjoy it, but you're going to feel a little sick afterwards, so you don't value that one as much as the first two. And then the fourth one, you're like, oh God, am I really going to eat this? Uh, or maybe you have to then cart that fourth one home and eat it cold later. So you, you still like it. You still would take the fourth piece of pizza if it were free, right? But you don't value it as much as the first three. The fifth piece of pizza, you're like, all right, this is getting ridiculous. I don't value this one very much at all. And then it continues to be downhill from there. General rule of thumb, 
marginal value or marginal benefit declines for higher quantities. You can also think about, well, how, how happy would you be if you received a dollar? Okay, now, now that lets you buy stuff, right? So you can think about the marginal benefit of just buying another dollar's worth of stuff. Well, if you're completely penniless, you got nothing, you're starving, a dollar's really great. If you're a millionaire, a dollar's not worth too much to you, right? You don't really care that much. It doesn't make you that much happier, right? Because the marginal benefit is declining. The first one is really great, and then once you get to number 1,005,363, uh, you don't really care so much. So that's what's happening here with marginal benefit going down. We have our table. How many jalapenos should I buy? So we already determined that I should buy the first jalapeno. The marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. I'm also going to buy the second jalapeno. Uh, the marginal benefit, again, is greater than the marginal cost. Third jalapeno, yeah, a dollar is greater than 20 cents. I don't value it as much as I did the second one, but it's still worthwhile. Same with the fourth one. 50 cents is greater than 20 cents. I'm going to go down the uh, fifth one. 20 cents is, is uh, worth it. It's still worth it. I value it at 20 cents. It costs 20 cents. Sure, I'll get it. Okay. Now, how about the sixth one? Uh, no. I'm not going to buy that one. That one only brings me 10 cents of value, but it's going to cost me 20 cents. If I buy it, I'm going to be worse off overall. Totally not worth it. That tells me that I'm going to keep buying more and more and more because I said yes to all these jalapenos until I got to number five and I said I'm going to stop. And that is also, not coincidentally, uh, the exact quantity at which marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Basically, I'm going to keep buying more and more and more until I realize that the next one has a marginal benefit below marginal cost, and that's where I'll stop, which means that I'm going to stop at the one where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Hey, uh, if you happen, by the way, to see one where they don't line up exactly, right, uh, maybe this one's only 19 cents or something like that, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to keep buying until the next one's not worth it, and that's when you stop. Anyway. So, I'm going to buy to the quantity where marginal benefit equals marginal cost because if I'm buying less than that, that tells me that I have more economic surplus to gain by buying more. If I was only buying three jalapenos, well, that fourth and fifth jalapeno are still worth it to me, but I'm not buying them. There's cash left on the table. I can make myself better off, and so I'm going to do so. Uh, and if I'm buying more than that, if I'm buying six jalapenos, that means that I'm buying a jalapeno for which I get less out of it than I spent on it. Not worth it. So I'm going to buy less until I get to marginal benefit equals marginal cost. That's where the rule comes from, and that's how we know that I'm going to maximize my economic surplus. I'm going to make myself as best off as possible by setting marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. And that gives us, once again, our golden rule. Marginal benefit equals marginal cost in a big nice rectangle. And like I mentioned before, this does not just apply to purchasing consumption decisions. It also applies to production, uh, strategic decisions, a decision of who you're going to get married to, all this sort of stuff. Uh, really, this is the economic model of behavior. We're going to describe behavior using incentives, and this is how you describe behavior using incentives, by thinking about how this works. So, that's the secret. I've given you the underlying key secret to economics. You can go get a PhD now if you want. Uh, and we're going to take this underlying behavioral model and it's going to apply both to consumers and producers. And we can think about the markets uh, as really being aggregations of the individuals that go into the consumer side of the market, all of them making their own marginal benefit equals marginal cost decisions and all the people going into the supply side of the market, each of them making their own marginal cost equals marginal benefit decisions. Uh, now, something to think about here is that you know, these marginal benefit and marginal cost, these relate to individual decisions, which means that they might look different depending on whose position you view them from. Let's take, for example, the consumers and producers in a market. Uh, so as we sort of established right here, so uh, we know what the consumers are going to view, the marginal benefit and marginal cost of a good as being. Right? The marginal benefit is the value they get from the good or the marginal value. And the marginal cost is what they had to spend on the good, right? In the jalapeno case, it was 20 cents. So it's the price of the good that they have to pay. But how about consumers? Or sorry, how about producers? If we put producers down here, well, what's the marginal cost for them? Well, just like we talked about before, it's the marginal cost of production. So it's the marginal 
cost of production, including all of their uh, you know, in, uh, opportunity costs and things like that. But what's the marginal benefit? What do you get when you sell another unit of the good? What do you get when you, when you sell that one additional unit? Well, you get paid the price. So the marginal benefit for a producer is the price. So the price is playing two roles here. It's the marginal benefit for the producer that's making them make their decision, or how they set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost, and it's the marginal cost for the consumer that helps them make their decision about how to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. So it's important to think about when we're setting up these, these issues about marginal benefit and marginal cost, what is marginal benefit and marginal cost, and for who? Because it might be different depending on whose perspective you're looking at it from. So, this is all independent behavior, but something interesting is going to happen when we put these together in the competitive market. Uh, you know, using the same logic that we had before, remember, the demand curve encodes the marginal value of the good, and the, the supply curve encodes the marginal cost. So what happens when we're at that equilibrium point? Well, let's draw it up again and see what we get. At our equilibrium point, we are currently selling a quantity where the marginal cost is our price right here, right? Marginal cost, uh, uh, sorry, the marginal cost um, is this amount right here, right? Because we know that the marginal cost can be seen on the supply curve. How about the marginal benefit? What's the marginal benefit here? Well, it's the marginal value that we see on the demand curve, and those are exactly the same, which means that the marginal benefit of the consumers equals the marginal cost of the producers, which means that, well, not only is each individual consumer and producer setting their marginal benefit equal to their marginal cost, because the producer's marginal benefit is the, mar is the consumer's marginal cost, this means that we're setting marginal benefit equal to marginal cost for the whole market all at once, which means that we're not just maximizing the individual consumer and producer's economic surpluses, we're maximizing economic surplus for the whole market. Entire of, the entirety of society is as getting as much out of this market as it possibly can. It's maximizing its economic surplus. And we know that this is happening because we can think about what is going on at each individual point on this demand and supply curve. And to show that, let me write out a mathematical formula of marginal benefit and marginal cost. And set them equal to so let's say, for example, that we're talking about reams of paper as a good. Okay, something boring like that. Uh, and if we have a, an equation here where our marginal benefit is equal to 55 minus 10q, and let's say that we happen to know the price of our paper. And now let's say that we know that our price of a ream of paper is 5. So how many reams of paper should we buy? Well, we're going to want to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. And we know that since we're a consumer, our marginal cost is the price. So we're going to want to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost means that we're going to want to set our price equal to 55 minus 10 Q, which you'll notice is an equation that gives us a relationship between the price and the quantity demanded, which is a demand curve. In fact, that's exactly what the demand curve is. That's exactly where the demand curve comes from. We just invented the demand curve out of marginal cost equals marginal benefit. What this means is that each point on this demand curve represents an individual consumer making their own decision about how to set marginal cost equal to marginal benefit. So this person right here, I'm going to draw a point on the demand curve. Uh, that person right there, they set their own marginal cost equal to their own marginal benefit. Well, what does that mean? Well, their marginal benefit is given by their position on the demand curve, right? And they decided to buy the good once the price hit that amount. Well, their price is their marginal cost. So by buying, by buying that unit, they were setting their marginal cost equal to their marginal benefit. Similarly, if we look at a, per, a point on the supply curve, this is representing a supplier. They are also setting their marginal cost equal to their marginal benefit. Their marginal benefit is the price. Their marginal cost is given by the supply curve. And they, we know they're going to sell that unit of the good because as soon as the price gets high enough, they're going to say, oh, my marginal cost will equal my marginal benefit. If I, I, if I want to do that, I'm going to have to sell that unit of the good. So each point on these supply and demand curves is a single person or firm making their own decision of how to set marginal cost equal to marginal benefit, which is going to drive their purchasing and producing decisions, which gives us the quantity supplied and quantity demanded that we're looking at. And when we get ourselves to equilibrium, we know that the marginal benefit of the last good produced 
is going to equal the marginal cost of the last unit or produced. Uh, which means that not only from an individual level, but from a societal perspective, we are maximizing our economic surplus, which is pretty cool. Let's switch gears a little bit. We've talked about how we can take the idea of marginal cost and marginal benefit and how it explains the individual behavior of consumers and producers and how that behavior gives us the purchasing and production decisions that give us the supply and demand curve. And we can build up that whole supply and demand curve, that whole market, just from those individual decisions that are based off the individual behavior of setting marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. Now, what else can we do with this idea? Well, one thing that we can do is start thinking about economic surplus. Right? Sur economic surplus is benefit minus cost, which we can figure out pretty good from our marginal benefit and marginal cost. What is the economic surplus provided by buying or selling one more unit of the good? Well, it's the difference between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost. So some measure of what the market is actually doing for us, what it's actually producing, the good it is putting into the world is measured by this economic surplus, by the difference between the marginal cost and the marginal benefit. So let's split this idea up. Let's just talk about the economic surplus of consumers. We're going to call that, not too surprisingly, consumer surplus. Uh, and we have this framework where we can talk about the marginal benefit and marginal cost of consumers, which lets us talk about the economic surplus of consumers. Now, remember, uh, we know that the demand curve is giving us the marginal value of the good. Uh, and the uh, marginal value is the same thing as their marginal benefit, the most that they're willing to pay. And so we're going to try to figure out what is the economic surplus that consumers are getting from purchasing this good. And so if I draw out a demand curve and a price, let's imagine that you are one of those many, many people on this demand curve. Let's say you're right here. Now, you, now we know that your marginal value of getting this unit of the good is right here. Let's say it's uh, 12. Now, if I follow down here, the amount you actually paid for the good is right here. It's the price. Let's say the price is uh, 8. Okay? So your marginal benefit as a consumer is the value you get out of this good, which is 12. The marginal cost that you have as a consumer is the amount that you paid for it, the price. So the difference between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost for you is four. Okay. Now they're not equal to each other yet. That means you're probably going to continue buying more units. But for this particular unit, you got a, an economic surplus of four from choosing to buy it. So your economic surplus that you get from this unit of the good is represented by the line that goes down from your marginal value to the price. So that's you. That's that unit that you bought right there. How about this guy over here? Well, his economic surplus is, again, the line between his point on the demand curve and the price. And how about this person in here? Okay, well, that goes right there. And this person over here, well, that goes right there. And if this person over here, that goes there. This person over here, that goes there. And this person over here, that goes there. And so on and so on. And you can sort of see where this is going, that we're sort of building this little triangle. And as we build more and more lines in here, we just get a nice solid triangle that represents the consumer surplus, the total economic surplus that every consumer in that market gets by consuming that good at that price. And so if we look at our supply and demand graph, the consumer surplus is the difference between the price people were willing to pay, their reservation price, their marginal value, their marginal benefit, and what they actually had to pay, the price. So we can fill in that triangle and say that that is consumer surplus. That is the value provided to consumers by the existence of this market. This area represents how much worse off consumers would be if this market didn't exist anymore. We can also think about what might happen if the price drops. Now, just intuitively, think about what might happen if the price drops. Would consumers be happy about that or unhappy? Consumers be happy about that, right? Consumers like lower prices. And in fact, we should, we're going to see that when the price goes down, from a rightward shift in supply, we're going to see that consumer surplus, that measure of how good off the consumers have it because of this market, is going to increase. And specifically, it's going to increase for two reasons. Uh, so we see this rightward shift in supply, we see that drop in price, and two things are going to happen. One is that everybody who was already buying a unit of the good is going to get to buy it at a lower price. 
right? You were getting a decent deal before, now you're getting an even better deal. Your economic surplus for this unit of the good just went up. But that's not the only thing that happens. Additionally, this price is gonna drop down lower than a number of new people's marginal values, and they're now going to find it worthwhile to buy this good. And so we're gonna get a more consumer surplus, not just from the people already in the market getting a better deal, but from more people entering the market uh, or, or now being willing to buy the unit of the good now that the price is low enough. So the consumer surplus goes up for two reasons when supply drops. So this is gonna give us a few sort of basic common sense things. So first of all, people like lower prices, no big surprise there. And also keeping in mind, there's a difference between value and price, right? A lot of the time when we talk, you know, in our normal lives about how much we value something at, it, that value that we put on it is affected by the price. How much do you value uh, having, let's say, uh, a, a soda? You, you think about not having a nice soda, okay, how much do you value it? Uh, how much would you be willing to pay for it, right? We're saying that your reservation price is how much you'd be willing, the most you'd be willing to pay. Then you can imagine going into a corner store and thinking about how much you'd be willing to pay for a soda. You think, I, I probably wouldn't pay more than two bucks at a 7-Eleven for a soda, okay? Uh, but what if you were like in a nice restaurant? Well, you might find yourself paying three or four dollars for a soda and being perfectly willing to do it, which suggests that your value of the soda is changing based on the, what the price is. But that's not right. That's not how we should think about value. When we see the price drop in this situation here, right, that demand curve itself, which represents the marginal value, that stays completely still, right? The value of the good itself does not change just because the price does. Instead, you're getting a better deal when the price drops. Your value of it stays the same, but what you had to give up to get it changes. Let's take an example of this. Let's take Netflix as an example. Now, you may not remember this if you think way, way back, but Netflix used to be a company where they would mail you DVDs and then you'd send it back. I guess they probably still do it, but I don't know anybody who does that anymore. Uh, but back in 2011, they were mostly doing this. The, the, the DVD rentals were their main thing, and they, they also did a little bit of video streaming as well. And for one low price of $10 a month, you could get both of these services. Okay, this is 2011. Now, in September 2011, they changed. Uh, they split these services into two. So the video rental or the DVD rental and the streaming services were now two different services, each of which cost $8. Now, if you wanted to get both of these services, which you probably did, uh, because at this time most people were using both of those services, you'd have to pay $16, which you'll note is a lot more than $10. So this is an increase in price for all of those Netflix consumers. Let's think about what this is gonna do to consumer surplus. So we're gonna start with Netflix in August. In August of 2011, uh, the price of a subscription to Netflix was $10. We can see it on the price axis there. And Netflix had 23.6 million subscriptions, okay? Now, then they raise the price, what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna see changes in the consumer surplus, and again, for two different reasons. So first of all, we're gonna lose consumer surplus because some people are gonna realize, okay, well, at this higher price, it's not worth it for me anymore. I'm gonna drop it, right? I valued Netflix at maybe 12 bucks a month, and so when it was 10 bucks, I was willing to buy a Netflix subscription, but now that it's 16, I'm out. So whatever value I was deriving, the $12 that I valued it at, minus the $10 that I had to pay, I was getting $2 of economic surplus there. No more, I get nothing now. So that triangle of consumer surplus goes away. That's lost consumer surplus. Also, all the people who are, it's still worth it to them to get that Netflix subscription. So they're still gonna buy it, they're still gonna pay for it, but they're not gonna be happy about it because they're paying a lot higher price than they were before. You can sort of imagine somebody reaching into your pocket uh, and taking out $6 a month, right? They're not gonna be happy about that. Whatever, what, however good of a deal they were getting before, they're getting a much less good deal now. That's a lost consumer surplus for them. And if you add up the consumer surplus lost by just all of those people, that's about $136.8 million of consumer surplus lost overnight. Uh, that's by the 22.8 million subscribers that they still had, which, and by the way, price went up, quantity demanded went down. They did lose subscribers as a result of this, which is exactly what you'd expect based on the law of demand. Price goes up, quantity goes down. Now, 
Uh, this makes them very angry that they lost this consumer surplus. Uh, they were very, very willing to express their anger. This is a picture of the Facebook thread uh, after they announced their change in the price. This was about uh, one day after it was announced, had 40,000 comments on it. A couple days later, had about 80,000 comments on it. Uh, a lot of them being very open in their negative uh, response to this price change, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, death threats and all sorts of stuff in that ugly little comments thread. Now, uh, anger was visceral and real, but of course people do follow incentives. The price changed, uh, but people still valued the Netflix service enough to continue subscribing to it. Uh, and so for a lot of people, that $16 was still worth it. They were still willing to hang on to their subscriptions at the higher price. And of course, as we know, uh, after 2011, uh, Netflix uh, improved their service considerably, which, as we know, increase in the quality of the product makes it better off, makes it more valuable to consumers. That's going to shift demand curve eventually to the right. Uh, so what we had before was an increase in price. We just moved along the demand curve. After the increase in quality of the Netflix product, uh, we would then see a rightward shift in demand, which is going to increase the, uh, the quantity that people are going to produce. And those lost subscribers that they had, they've gained back by improving their quality uh, since then. So they today have a whole lot more subscribers than they did before. It's got, I'd say, 36.3 million subscribers here. I believe those numbers are a few years old by this point. And that's basically it. Uh, that's the whole idea we have with consumer surplus here. We're going to be able to do a little bit more with it later. But the basic idea is that once we have the idea of the demand curve representing all those points at which marginal benefit equals marginal cost, and knowing where marginal benefit and marginal cost are on that graph for the consumers, we can think about the economic surplus being generated for consumers by the existence of the market. And think about how the changes in that market are not just going to affect price and quantity, but also the well-being of the consumers in the market and how they feel about being in the market, and whether or not they're going to make some sort of angry Facebook comment. All right. That's it. Uh, I will see you next time. Uh, and until then, uh, I, I do suggest trying to think about marginal benefits and marginal costs. Think about what your marginal benefits and marginal costs are in the decisions that you face in your everyday life. Uh, and whether or not you are setting your marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. Are there opportunities available to you for which the marginal benefit of doing a little bit more of that thing would outweigh the marginal cost? Maybe you should do them. Increase your economic surplus a little bit more. Uh, and also make our little behavioral theory a little bit more predictive of what you're actually going to do. Because remember, we're predicting basically all behavior and especially market behavior on the basis of this one simple golden rule. Thank you very much.